So I'm glad to be here with you to open up the scriptures. So I just get to continue on as if I'm a part of the teaching team uh, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14. So you won't skip a beat. Mark, chapter 14. Uh, Ian covered a portion of that last time. Uh, and I'm going to pick up where we left off in verse 27. And as you're opening there, it's probably one of my favorite sounds to hear in church is the turning of Bible pages. I don't think there's anywhere else on the planet, not even the public school system, where you get to hear that sound or whatever the sound of you swiping on your iPads or whatever, <laughs> just this mass looking at one book. But as you open to Mark 14, consider that this is a passage of great self-disclosure. Now, when I say that phrase self-disclosure, that probably terrifies many of you. Most people are terrified by the idea of self-disclosure. The fact that in that statement, nothing is hidden, that everything is exposed, that all hidden things are now open. And, and, and keep something in mind as we, we look at the passage this afternoon, that this gospel, Mark's gospel, is likely for most scholarship, Peter's gospel, written by Mark's pen. John Mark, who was the cousin or the nephew of Barnabas is the author, but Peter orally sent that his way. And, and the church uh, historian, a man by the name of Eusebius, that's, you get those kind of names when you're a church historian, something cool and intelligent like Eusebius. So those of you, you ladies pregnant right now, thinking for a name for a boy, try Eusebius on for size. But Eusebius said concerning this gospel, which most say is, is Peter's gospel uh, written with Mark's pen, this is what Eusebius said. Mark became Peter's interpreter and wrote accurately all that he remembered the Lord had said or done. For Mark himself neither heard or followed the Lord, but later on followed Peter. Now, here's what's a fascinating thought about reading the gospel of Mark. Mark's gospel is perhaps the place where Peter looks the worst in all of the New Testament. And Peter wrote this about himself. It's like he just rats himself out. It's a place of great self-disclosure. He writes a historical confession. Now the question is, what would motivate somebody to be so honest about those dark places in their life? Well, I have a suspicion that Peter was at this place in his life able to just sort of write down, have Mark transcribe the story and, and all of its sordid details of his betrayal and denial of Jesus because of his encounter with the risen Jesus. Because he'd encountered the risen Lord and the risen King had made everything okay, Peter was now able to say, write it down in all of its gory details because I've been far removed from that place in my life. And so he's able to write with complete candor. And, and with the time allotted to me this morning, I want to talk to you primarily about how an encounter with the risen Christ will destroy self-consciousness. How encountering the risen Christ destroys self-consciousness. Now, as you saw, I have four great kids. You would know they're great, but, but I think they are. We call them the Fowler Four. My middle one is named Tobias. He was the one right in front of me. When Tobias was a little guy, he had a moment of complete self-disclosure. Now, not what you're thinking. He didn't take them all off or anything like that. Uh, but, but Toby, uh, one particular afternoon, uh, when I drove home, I pull up and, and see what some of you dads, how many of you dads out there, put your hand up. Noon dads, whoo, all right. You would know when you drive home and you have this scene, you know what's going down. When I drive up, I see my middle son, Toby, sitting on the couch by the front window looking out. And, and, and I put two and two together. I know what happened. He was giving his mom such a hard time that day. She didn't know what to do with him. So she said, sit on the couch and wait for your father to come home. Like back in the 1950s style parenting, right? So I pull up and I'm like, oh, great. Like right away, going to be dealing with this element of a rebellious kid. So I come in and, and Toby has had a transformation. I mean, he's, he's our kid who, who's the lover, not the fighter, who's, who's always fearful and safety conscious, won't climb a tree, always wants to be on time. And so he's kind of Winnie the Pooh-esque 
Well, well, Winnie the Pooh turned William Wilberforce, turned William Wallace even. Like I, I walk in and he's just chest out, dad, I'm ready to take my spanking. <laughs> so he spent that time doing a little bit as I would later find out some reverse psychology on himself. So he jumps up and marches right to the bedroom where he knows he's gonna get a spanking and lays out on the bed. He's ready to take it like a man. I'm like, yeah. And, and just as he's laying out, I'm thinking, what happened to this kid? He goes, this is gonna be funny. I'm like, oh, that's what game you've been playing with yourself. He convinced himself on the couch, this is gonna be a pleasant experience. So first SWAT, he starts laughing. By SWAT and a half, the laugh goes from ha 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 till he broke and the spanking was successful. And just thinking back on that, that scenario, like a moment of, of complete, total, honest self-disclosure because what? He had convinced himself that what seemed like it would normally be a painful experience was actually going to be pleasurable. Now, now in reality, with that silly parenting analogy, um, this is exactly how gospeled, resurrection-believing Christ followers can view painful self-disclosure. Because of resurrected Jesus, even my worst can be turned to something beautiful. Now let's read Peter's story of painful self-disclosure in verse 27. We begin Mark chapter 14. Are you there? If you're there, you can say, got it. If you're still not there, man, it's noon, right? That's why you're at the noon service. Um, Mark chapter 14, verse 27 this narrative part of the dialogue starts off with these fateful words. You will all fall away. Now that's a great way to start an evening conversation. And now, now remember, Ian talked to us last week about this comes on the hills of what just happened. The Lord's Supper was instituted. Jesus sung a hymn and everybody's feeling warm and fuzzy inside. You know what I mean? It'd be like you husbands taking your white out, wife, white out, wife out for an evening of romance and candlelit dinners. And, and during that romantic experience, say, honey, I know that you are going to have an affair on me. What? I didn't see that one coming. Jesus, after all this romance and beauty and dinner and singing, says, all of you are going to fall away from me. But, but the essence is, and it's going to be okay. There's enough grace in me to make even that statement be all right. You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, now he quotes Zechariah 13, 7, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into the Galilee. Now Peter declares, I can see him with his chest out, even if all fall away, I will not faithful last words truly jesus says i tell you today yes tonight before the rooster crows twice you yourself will disown me three times but peter insisted emphatically he's not letting this go he thinks he's self-aware even if I do, even if I, excuse me, have to die with you, I will never disown you. And then all the others said the same. Now fast forward to verse 26. Because we're going to see what, what kind of a different man he becomes from here to there. Between here and there, verse 27 to 31, over to verse 66, lots has happened. The betrayer, Judas, has come, giving him that faithful betrayal kiss. Jesus has been arrested by the Jewish Sanhedrin, the, that, that governing body of religious leaders. Jesus has been falsely accused, spat on, and now he's in the process of being beaten. And this is what Peter's up to. Verse 66. While Peter was below in the courtyard... One of the servant girls, think peasant, poor junior high girl, right? Not very intimidating. Any of you men intimidated by a poor junior high girl? Let's talk afterwards. You might need some counseling. Um, so one of the servants of the high priest, this, this peasant servant girl came by. 
Verse 67, when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him, squinted her eyes. You also were with the Nazarene Jesus, she said, but he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about. He said, and he went out into the entryway. Now that's one. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, now she's including other people, this fellow is one of them. Again, verse 70, he denied it. That's two. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, surely you are one of them for you are a Galilean. Now the pressure's beginning to mount. He's being recognized, his accent, his look. You follow Jesus, don't you? And he began, verse 71, doing what he said he would never do even to death. He began with force to call down curses. He's using four-letter expletives to emphasize how far from Jesus he is. He began to call down curses and he swore to them, I don't know this man that you're talking about. That's three. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. Immediately, the rooster crowed the second time. And Peter, you know what? You know what brought chills down his spine is the sound of a rooster in Jerusalem at that time, which was historically forbidden. What was a rooster doing in the city anyway? And he hears it and instantly, note, he remembered the word that Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. Now that phrase gets me every time. Verse 72, and he broke down and wept. Grown men don't do this very often unless you're an emo Portland guy. <laughs> he wept. He breaks down. He weeps like a baby. This is extreme, vulnerable devastation. It's guilty and it's hopeless. It's what happens when you really fail in life. Have you ever been in a Mark 1472 situation in your life? A time of total devastation, broke down and weeping over your sin. Perhaps it was a moral failure, a time when you failed somebody, you broke trust, you broke a promise, you, you, you compromised your integrity, you lied and cheated and stole, you spoke evil, you failed God and the people that you love. And like Peter, you swore this would never happen to you. Has this ever happened in your life? Are you, if so, if that's happened to you, are you at a place that, that given the face mic, you'd be willing to get up here and have full disclosure and talk about it? As if you were talking about somebody else, are you at a Peter place where you could say, no, write it down in all of its filthy, gory, ugly details. Write it as it was. And I'm, I'm gonna dictate it to you from my own mouth. This is what I did against the God whom I loved. This is what I did against the Savior who died. Are you at a place where you could have full self-disclosure or with your sin, or do you find yourself at a place where even the thought or memory of what happened in the past is so painful to think about that it almost crushes you? You just don't even like to remember it. Is there a space or a place in God? Is there a theological truth where the Father can make us like Peter who'd be willing to live in bold self-disclosure? Well, I want to spend the rest of our time together gospeling us in this story. What I'm calling the end of shame encounters with a resurrected king. Goodbye, shame. How does our encounter with the risen king bring us to a place like Peter was at where we could talk about what we've done 
like Peter did. Well, I want to bring forth four main ideas in Peter's story that I think go back to the reason that he was able to be so bold in the face of shame because of his encounter with the resurrected king. So first of all, we're gonna talk about, number one, believing the resurrection. Believing the resurrection. Secondly, knowing what it has accomplished. Knowing what it has accomplished. Third, embracing the way of the resurrection. And fourthly, living a resurrected life. And we'll go back to these four points and sort of unpack them as we navigate through this afternoon together. So so point number one, believing the resurrection. I would suggest to you that one of the major differences between Judas the betrayer and Peter the denier is very slim and subtle. I believe it has to do with the resurrection, at least in part. There are a lot of similarities between Judas and Peter. At least as you look at their narrative in the story, they were both chosen by Jesus to be one of the 12. They both at one time in their ministry called devils. How would you like that to be on your resume? One time the incarnate son of God called me a devil. They both were warned of their upcoming betrayals and they both failed. They both denied and betrayed Jesus. Now we would say, before we knew the end of both of these men, they're both headed headed down a very dangerous path, but that's where their paths part. Because Peter would go on to have full repentance and restoration and actually become one of the pillars in the church where Judas goes on to be one of the few suicides ever talked about in scripture. And today he's an infamous traitor like no other. I mean, people aren't naming their sons Judas, but there may even be a few Peters in here this morning. Any Judases here? No, right? That was strategic, right? No one wants to be lumped in with this guy. What was the difference between these two men? I would suggest to you in part encounters with the resurrected king and how it changed Peter's life. Brothers and sisters, believing in the literal bodily resurrection of Jesus shapes your hope. For instance, take two terminally ill people. One of them believes in the resurrection of the body and the other does not. Who do you think of the two is going to be more equipped to face death? Or take two people that are both fighting against injustice and oppression in the world. One of them is is an atheistic naturalist who doesn't believe in the resurrection of a body. They think when you die, you go into a pit and rot. Versus someone who says, I believe that, that the Bible is true and I will experience the resurrection of the body. Which of those two people is going to take their work more seriously. The the one who believes in an afterlife knows that all of their effort and work and fighting for injustice is actually going to be fully realized when King Jesus fully reigns versus someone else who thinks, after I'm dead, hopefully I've passed the legacy on to the next generation because it won't go forward with me. And in that way, we see that the believing in the resurrection is so crucial but we don't believe this just to make ourselves feel better. Some way of talking ourselves into the fact that our lives have meaning and purpose. We have good reason to believe in the hope of the resurrection. And among many proofs that I don't have time to talk about this morning, one of the major proofs of the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the eyewitness testimony. The Apostle Peter excuse me, the Apostle Paul wrote later in 1 Corinthians 15, speaking about of risen Jesus said this, 1 Corinthians 15, 5 and 6, the risen Jesus appeared to Cephas and then to the 12. And after that, look, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living. Now, we base our entire judicial system on eyewitness testimony. There were over 500 still living that said, yes, I saw risen, resurrected Jesus. 
But also add with that the testimony of Peter here. Peter's bold self-disclosure is great evidence for the truth of the account of the resurrection. And you have to put your head space in the, in the mind of a first century Jewish culture. They're not like our Western uh, Jerry Springer culture where we're celebrated for going on television and talking about the, 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 the major mistakes of our dysfunctional life and family. And everyone laughs and tunes in and uh, TiVo's it and all that. No, like, like in, in this culture, in this first century Jewish culture, it was what they call an honor shame culture in which if you made a mistake, that mistake could not be erased, would not be celebrated, but rather that mistake would haunt you and follow you. It could not be remedied. So no one would write this about themselves unless it were true because it would mean a loss of honor and social ostracization. For Peter to write this was at great cost to his life. In the ancient minds, this would completely discredit a movement if you were to talk so bluntly about your fallen state and major mistakes you'd made. The story of the resurrected Jesus is true and believing it absolutely changes the way that we live and the way that we view our sin and failure and tragedy and our future. This is our hope. I don't know if you've heard much from the, the renowned Christian woman, Johnny Erickson Todd. You probably know her story. She's quadriplegic. She's a speaker and an author and has been very, very influential in this generation. And she wrote this about the nature of the hope that we have, even in the face of the hardest tragedy. She, she wrote, I, I still can hardly believe it. I was shriveled, bent fingers, atrophied muscles, gnarled knees and no filling from the shoulders down will one day have a new body, light, bright and clothed in righteousness, powerful and dazzling. Can you imagine the hope this gives someone who's spinal cord injured like me or someone who is cerebral palsied or brain injured who has multiple sclerosis? Imagine the hope this gives someone who is manic depressive, no other religion, no other philosophy promises new bodies, hearts, and minds only in the gospel of Jesus Christ to hurting people find such incredible hope. This is our hope. This is why we can be bold in the face of our own failure or tragedy because first off, we believe in the resurrection. Secondly, we know what it has accomplished. The resurrection is essentially your receipt that says it's been paid for. Romans 4.25 says that he was delivered for our sins and raised for our justification. So the resurrection is proof that your life has been paid for. It's like, um, it's like going to Costco, right? You saw my family. We've made many trips to Costco. In the Fowler Swagger Wagon, my wife's got like two carts full of stuff, right? And you, you know, you're at Costco and you just like bought the store out because your 13-year-old is growing like nuts and he's eating like two grown men and you're just trying to keep up right keep food in the fridge and in front of his face and you know you you come up to Costco you're trying to get out of there with all this stuff and and before you get out they want to see a receipt proof that the stuff that you're trying to make it out with has actually been paid for and the resurrection is essentially the proof that we've been paid for it allows even the weakest of us access into the kingdom to join this new society of the kingdom people. And note that the kingdom society is not for the strong or for those who, who can show forth how much they're worth or that they're able to do it. That's not Christianity. Other religions teach, prove your worth, prove that you're, you're worthy to be accepted. But Christianity is a resurrection religion. Christianity is, doesn't say prove your worth, but it says your worth has been accomplished through somebody else. And to demonstrate this way of the resurrection in the foundation documents, we have before us a record of how one of the founders of Christianity, the Apostle Peter, failed miserably. 
Now, this isn't how you start a company or a religion by saying, this is how one of the founders of this religion, movement, or company failed terribly. But that's what we're reading in front of us. This is what resurrection life accomplishes. Peter was restored back to a place of kingdom, kingdom excuse me, usefulness after being a total failure. And the resurrection kingdom phrase echoes on 2 Timothy 2.13. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. We believe the resurrection. We know what is accomplished. And then thirdly, we embrace the way of the resurrection. The way of the resurrection is this, is the way of life through death. Now, I don't mean to discourage you here at the noon service, but you're going to do in the process of your Christian life and have done a lot of dying. What do I mean by that? The sense of death that comes in repentance and confession of some of the worst things you've done. Confronting that you are not able. Confronting your own weaknesses. That is the process of death into life. When the Bible talks about repentance, it talks about it in terms of death to, to an old way of thinking and living into the new life. But that's always in process in the Christian life. Death into life, death into life, the, the way of the resurrection. And in Peter's story, that's, that's seen quite hauntingly. This admitting of spiritual poverty and this death that, that brings life. Um, in John chapter 21... When Jesus finally encounters Peter, after all's been said and done and Peter's failed and Jesus is resurrected, when he encounters Peter in John 21, he brings him into something that's very hauntingly similar to the night of his own failure. The last time Peter saw Jesus face to face, Luke chapter 22 tells us, after Peter denied, it says the Lord looked straight at Peter. Peter made eye contact with Jesus, whose face was flowing with blood and spit from those religious people and the Romans who were beating him and mocking him. Peter makes his final denial, and right then, Luke 22 says, the Lord looks straight at him. The last time Peter had face to face with Jesus, it wasn't in such good terms, but Jesus has called him to a beach where they're going to have some face to face time. He doesn't just call him to a beach, though. John 21, he calls him down to a fire. A restoration fire. A fire where Jesus is barbecuing fish, saying, eat, Peter. Come and dine with me, Peter. The last time Peter was around a fire, it was a denial fire. And then, then in the John 21 narrative, it, it, some interesting things are said. One of the things Jesus says to Peter is, Simon which his name used to be Peter, was changed to Peter, but Simon's his old nature. He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, why would Jesus say that? Because remember what Peter said in our text, 1429, Mark 1429. He said, even if all of those idiots, that's my addition, maybe it's in the original Greek. <laughs> even if all of those guys betray you, I will not. Now, that's not like, that's not a great thing to say in front of your friends. Like, all these guys are right there. And he's like, look, Jesus, I know you said they're all going to fall away, but, but I'm the one who won't. Yeah, Judas, Thomas, John, of course. Man, I know John's headed for the trouble. But even if they do, I won't. And then Jesus says to him at his restoration service, Simon, son of John, you love me more than these? Peter's quiet. He'd been humbled. Life has a way of breaking you. And in that, he says nothing. Lord, you know that I'm trying to love you. That's actually probably a better rendering of the Greek text. Jesus says, do you love me with agape, the highest love? And Peter says, Lord, you know, I'm trying to phileo you. I'm trying to like you. I'm trying to be a good friend to you. But you know, I'm weak. I'm not capable of the love you're asking from me, but, but then Jesus goes about this with Peter. He play acts this three times. And at the third time, John chapter 21, verse 17, it says that Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him three times. Peter knew the significance of three times. 
You mean we're going to go back to this like three times denial, three times now I'm, I'm restoring this place of my love for you? What is Jesus doing? Jesus is bringing Peter back into this place of failure not to rub his nose in it. He's letting Peter experience the death that brings life. He's bringing Peter into a place of his death, of his illusions, of his self-sufficiency, death to his belief in his own power to be what he was supposed to be. And at this very place of his failure, Jesus plunges him into the resurrection grace. He's securing in Peter, Peter, I love you and I know all of it. Peter, I love you and you can't shake it. And I'll accept whatever little love you can give back, but I'm asking you this, Peter, the way of the resurrection is that we be humble into life. I heard one sermon and, and, and the guy preaching it said something that I thought was fascinating. He said, we are broken into life. And then went on to say that, that in the world, in this system, in this culture, in the way we live, when something is broken, it loses value. But in the kingdom air, a thing does not even begin to be worth anything until it has been broken. God puts a premium on broken things. No one comes into the light of Jesus apart from personal crisis and brokenness. No one comes back into the light of Jesus apart from personal brokenness and humility. Now, whether that's inflicted upon you or self-inflicted, Jesus is constantly asking us, humble yourself in the sight of God and you'll be lifted high. And so in this, this beautiful resurrection story, we step into it and we allow ourselves to live in resurrection. And we're play actors of a great truth. We embrace the way of resurrection. And then finally, as Peter has been secured in his place in God, and Jesus just saying, Peter, you're back, okay? You've been restored. Fourthly, we see living a resurrected life. Living the resurrected life. From this point, Peter steps into his new life. Restored back to a place of kingdom usefulness when every time Peter said, Lord, you know I'm trying to love you, he said, feed my sheep, tend my lambs, feed my lambs, take care of my people. Peter, you want to love me? You love them. Now, I know some people that tell me that, Brian, I, mean, I love God, I love Jesus, but I don't like people. Bzzz. Wrong answer. Because Jesus said, you love me, then, 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 then show that by loving them. You can't disconnect from loving the people of God. And Peter's in full swing back into a place of a shepherd, a, a useful man of God, a, being a useful woman of God, back into kingdom usefulness. And then in Acts chapter 1 and 2, something tr tremendous happens in Peter's life. He is baptized in the Holy Spirit. And, and a man was one, at one time not able to speak boldly before a junior high girl, stands up in a very hostile audience on the day of Pentecost, and he preaches a sermon that was so persuasive that it says they were cut to the heart. 3,000 people get saved and water baptized. The church begins rocket. Like, this was Peter? We're talking days between denier and now he's speaking the word and thousands are getting saved. He's restored back to a place of kingdom usefulness. And that is the life of the resurrection. This is the place that God wants us in constantly. Our life cycling through this, this, this whole big story of creation, fall, redemption, new creation. You know, that, I mean, that really summarizes the whole Bible, right? The big arc story of the Bible Creator creates, man falls in the garden, Genesis 3. The outcome of that is that from Genesis 3 on, God is redeeming, drawing back, bringing his people, restoring his people into a place where it will finally culminate. Revelation 22, new heavens, new earth, something beautiful is happening. Our lives are lived in that kind of cycle. 
Creation, fall, redemption. Creation, fall, redemption. God makes you for a purpose. You fall from that purpose. You trash your vow and your pledge and, and then he brings you back and restores you and then you step into that again. We live our lives in a microcosm of the bigger story, just as Peter did. And so too we. And in all of this, the grace of God is present, brothers and sisters, at your worst failure. The place where shame and hiding once existed, Peter is able to retell his story. Say, Mark, don't leave anything out. You remember also in Luke chapter 22, Jesus says something to Peter. He says, Simon, Simon, you know, like I have kids. So I, when I say their name more than once, like pay attention. Like I have Silas, Silas. I say that all the time. That's, that's number 13 or number one. He's 13. Adolescent fog is settled over his brain. <laughs> Silas, Silas. And he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that after you failed, because you're going to fail, that you would strengthen your brothers. You're going to be back to a place where you can tell your story. You, that, that literally some of you here could stand up here and say, I had an eating disorder, but I'm not ashamed to talk about it because it's so far in the rear view mirror because of the resurrected Jesus Christ. I struggled with immorality. I was a thief and a drunkard and a liar and a cheat and a swindler. I was the worst. And I have even fallen in my Christian journey, but I could now speak like Peter to say, you know, I was following Jesus and fell flat. But I can stand here and say, but because he's alive because I've seen him. I'm participating in a resurrection story. And so if I'm going to retell it, I'm not going to leave anything out. Because I've been converted. I've been healed. I've been saved because Jesus has been praying for me. And I've, I've been brought into a place where I can use my journey, my story to strengthen other people. Goodbye, shame. Goodbye, hiding. Forget you. I've had an encounter with the risen Christ. Amen?